CHGO White Sox postgame show coming to you live from the CHGO studios uh, of Studio B yeah. down in here of West Loop of Chicago. Uh, the hell, Herb? We got we got uh, demoted. I'm thrown off by the win. All these wins, we got demoted. <laughs> what Won the three hell? in a row, and we're back to Studio B. It's even a, though I love Studio B. Well, Studio B is my favorite. It's a math equation too. I, yeah. I like. I think we need more. Greenery. Yeah, they have three over there, and we only have two. And the Cubs people, man, they started their game at like six. Still waiting out the rain delay. It's still going. Yeah, I remember there was one time with the score, uh, doing a Cubs Cardinals game. Four and a half hour rain delay, Ugh. and they still finished it. Ugh. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 I mean, Major League Baseball. Just bang the game; it's done. These games don't count anymore. Well, for the Cubs, they do, but the, the nine Mets, they don't care. Welcome in to the CHGO White Sox post game show. Uh, I am Sean Anderson, uh, host of C- the CHGO White Sox post game show. Uh, thank you everyone for hanging out with us and celebrating the win. Uh, hit the thumbs up button alongside me, Herb Lawrence. Hello. The CHGO White Sox community leader. You can follow him on Twitter at Ecknerall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. I already said that. Um, but he does a good job. So uh, go follow him there. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Uh, Steven's all mad that we don't have our socials. Uh, so, uh, hey, well, there, there you go, Steven. I just did, did your job. And you can Thank follow you. the show uh, at CHGO underscore White Sox. We're coming to you live after a win. 5-1. to one. The Sox 22. Scotty Pods. Games under 500. There they go. Uh, probably won't talk much about the game because there was a lot of drama. A lot of tea spilled last night. Uh, had a afternoon game yesterday, an early one on Peacock. Didn't even talk about uh, Peacock and how you know how horrible of an experience it was to try to watch that game. Oh, my Jesus. Uh, especially for Vinny. Uh, but that was yesterday's game. Uh, today was fine and normal with Steve and Jason on NBC Sports Chicago. But Keenan Middleton talked to Jesse Rogers yesterday about... The White Sox clubhouse and the White Sox culture. Uh, the struggling Chicago White Sox, and I'm reading this just verbatim from Jesse's story. Uh, the struggling Chicago White Sox, whose fallout contention culminated with moving veteran players at the trade deadline, were plagued by a culture that had, quote, unquote, no rules, in which a rookie regularly fell asleep in the bullpen, former White Sox relief pitcher Keenan Middleton said Sunday. You have rookies sleeping in the bullpen during the game. You have guys missing meetings. You have guys missing pitcher fielding practice and there are no consequences for any of this stuff middleton said multiple sources who corroborated middleton's account to espn said a pitcher was seen napping during games as well as skipping fielding practice uh, and then middleton said the problems at the white Sox predated his arrival this season as well as Griffalls. the team finished 81 and 81 last year under larusa the hall of fame manager before he left the job due to health concerns quote when i got to spring training i heard a lot of the same stuff was happening last year uh middleton said it's happening again this year, so not sure how you could change it. I don't tell you to not miss PFPs. Again, those are very important. Yeah. Uh, they don't tell you not to miss meetings, and if it happens, it's just okay, end quote. Uh, that turned into a lot of stuff spewing out and unraveling about the White Sox having no rules and no culture. We'll play a little bit of Rick Hahn. We'll play a little bit of Yasmani Grandal. But her, mm-hmm. and before we even get into the story about T.A. and Grandal mm-hmm. uh, that our guy Shane Reardon reported on, what do you make of this? What, what was your thoughts when that stuff originally, just this, the Keenan stuff specifically, started to unfold? Very believable. Uh, just one thing, because Keenan Milton's a journeyman middle reliever where things like this, breaking bad on the culture of the clubhouse, and we'll hear from Rick Hahn later on, The first one of the first things he says about the clubhouse is kind of like Vegas and kind of like Fight Club. You don't talk about the clubhouse. And so this is damaging to Keenan Middleton's future as a baseball player. So I hope he took a calculated risk. And before he opened his mouth to talk to Jesse, he thought about those things. So this is why I think that he's telling truth because he knows that breaking bad on the White Sox, their clubhouse culture can have repercussions for him and his future Next year, he's a free agent after this year. And so if people think you're, quote unquote, a snitch, maybe not in the major leagues anymore, especially a guy who's a French guy. He's got almost a four ERA pitched well, I thought, for the White Sox. But if you're on the border of being a major league pitcher and then you got that put on top of you, it's questionable. 
I hope it doesn't affect his future career because I think he has a decent amount of uh, talent there. But that's why I believe him, firstly. And then secondly, the White Sox have done nothing to impress me as far as that not being the case, what Keenan Milton's saying. And as you hear, you'll hear from Rick Hahn, he says the guy that Keenan Middleton refers to was true. The guy who was sleeping, that's true, but he has a, a further story there. So I'll tease you with that if you haven't heard it yet. But there wasn't a lot of you know blowback from people. And Lance Lynn went on to Foul Territory, A.J. Brzezinski's podcast, and pretty much corroborated what Keenan Middleton said. He said, hey, I've been here a lot longer than Keenan Middleton, and uh, i got to say one thing. He ain't saying nothing wrong. There ain't nothing wrong about that. And then in the interview with AJ and Scott Braun, he pretty much said he would uh, correct anything that Keenan said wrong, and he just shut his mouth. Mm -hmm. So to give you the impression that Keenan wasn't lying. So I can believe most of what Keenan said is true. And this White Sox clubhouse and the culture, we've seen something other than just wins and losses being wrong with this team. There's a culture. Jose Abreu went away from this team and had words for Sports Illustrated right after that and said, you know, it's not family. They're not treating you right there. They're not They're not great there. I mean, we had Dallas Keuchel when he first entered with the White Sox pretty much had to lay the hammer down. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not how we do things. I came from Houston, a winning culture over there. This is how we're supposed to do things. Same thing with uh, Kendall Graveman said that when he came over from the Astros. And you have other players saying the same thing. And so I think he's not lying at all. He has nothing to lie about. He has much more to lose than to gain from saying the stuff that he said about the White Sox. And I'm glad that he put his name on it because there's nothing worse than I hate than when somebody – is anonymous and starts talking smack about a specific person. Well, and literally, like, there was something I was talking about uh, smack about two weeks ago about uh, an anonymous GM uh, talking about uh, the Angels adding uh, to keep Shohei uh, around or at least, you know, to, to buy for Shohei and maybe try to impress him and be like, oh, that's very nba That's like, you need an anonymity for that? Like, Keenan yeah. Middleton, we finally wanted something to explain all of this. Yep. and. Hey, maybe you don't believe Keenan Middleton. I don't really know why you wouldn't. I mean, he, he did have the spat earlier with the Astros, right? Yeah. Where he said they were cheating uh, and, and stuff, and then there, you know, he was using he was found to use tack uh, in his Mariners career. So some people are saying he was a little bit of a hypocrite there. Like maybe you can try. It. I'm just trying to figure out some ways you can like deface his character. Maybe that's it. But like Lance Lynn. The guy, the guy we thought was the whole culture setter, the guy we thought was the whole leader, mm -hmm. basically did the same thing. Yeah. Didn't say as much words, but, I mean, he didn't correct anything. Nope. He didn't feel like it, it needed to be corrected. And um, the thing is, too, like, Lance, that's reflecting on Lance to me. Like, I saw him as a leader, and if he's corroborating the story, it only reflects poorly on Lance because his leadership wasn't enough. Well, and that was his guy, too, Tony Lursa, too. Yep. I mean, like we, I mean, I mean, again, it felt like Tony really lacked the ability to run and lead that clubhouse, and, and that, I think, really f has started to show. And um, I think Pedro's way too in over his fucking head. Mm. I mean, that's just been real clear, I, I, I think, with this entire back and forth, all this talk about culture, and we'll get to it. Um, there is some comments uh, on our YouTube page uh, of Griffol, but let's get to Rick. Um, but before we get to Rick... Um, Keenan also did say, we came in with no rules. I don't know how you police the culture if there are no rules or guidelines to follow because everyone's doing their own thing. Like, how do you say anything about it? Because there are no rules. And I think he was asked, because he's in the Yankees clubhouse, like, yep. do you stick by what you said after you know, what Han and Pedro said? And he said, yeah. So, I mean, not only is he speaking with his name, capital K, capital M, Keenan Middleton, <laughs> uh, he's also like, yeah, I said it, and it's damn true. Uh, here's Rick Han trying to add his side to the story, I guess. I mean, I, I, I did watch this. I don't think that he's trying to deface Keenan Middleton, but there is some weird stuff. He's using Ed, Ho Ed Hominin attacks versus Keenan Middleton, which I don't dig. Did Courtney teach you that one? 
She did. Is that, is that lawyer, some lawyer she speak did. right there? She is. She did. She she's, <laughs> she didn't teach me it, but she's the one who said it today. She's like, oh, she's, she's I'd have an attack on him, that guy. It's like you could just say what he said was incorrect instead of attacking his character and what he did, and you'll hear what Rick Hahn says at the beginning of this. All right, well, shout out, Courtney. Let's hear this ad hominem shit. Frankly, the first rule in the clubhouse is what goes on in the clubhouse is supposed to stay there. I'm a big believer in that tenant. Uh, however, uh, when an individual player casts aspersions and puts his name on it, I feel a responsibility to respond. Uh, quite frankly, um, it's a little bit ironic that Keenan's the one saying this because my last conversation with him face to face was a week ago in this clubhouse where he sought me out to apologize for his unprofessional behavior. Uh, unprofessional behavior that Pedro had called him out on and had an individual meeting with him about uh, and Keenan wanted to apologize for. I told him at the time I figured that was a one-off and not something that anyone needed to get in greater detail of. Uh, and he shared that he understood there was a trade deadline coming up and that if we moved him, uh, he would be very interested in returning to us as a free agent. So for a number of reasons, the sanctity of the clubhouse, his own personal experience here, as well as what he expressed to me as his future desires, I was surprised to see the report uh, this morning. As for the content of the report, uh, unfortunately, I mentioned to you a few weeks ago that there's going to probably be some palace intrigue around here, and you had to be careful about sourcing and what kind of information was out there and who was saying what and not getting both sides. Uh, as for the specifics he laid out there, I'll go one by one by them and explain why each of them were off. Uh, at no point over the course of this year has there been a reliever sleeping in the bullpen during a game. That's just wrong. Uh, we do have a player, position player, who has fairly serious sleep issues. And as part of our sports performance program of trying to address that issue, he has been given permission and in fact encouraged to sleep in the clubhouse at times. Earlier in the season, a couple of our veteran players approached me complaining about such behavior. To their credit, they thought they were trying to help the environment. And when I explained to them the background of the player and why we were doing that, they relented and understood. Perhaps that's something that got lost in translation in Keenan's report, but at no point have we had a player sleeping in the bullpen. Um, young player missed infield practice, and there were no repercussions. We did have a young player miss infield practice, and for the next three days he was out there doing infield practice as extra work, as a means of breaking through and holding him accountable for missing the practice and showing the importance of being there. Uh, the meeting in Toronto where only pitchers spoke, it's not true. Andrew Benintendi spoke during that meeting. It was, a, again, something that's supposed to stay in the clubhouse, but once you open the door and subject us to criticism, we're going to be a little more candid about it. So, again, no one in this organization for the last several weeks has run from the fact that we've had cultural issues and we need to improve the leadership in that room. Uh, we're going to continue to strive to get better in that area, but one thing we're not going to do is stand idly by while false reports are put out there about the character of the men that remain in that room. So you would, uh, the other one of the other things said about no rules, no accountability, you would dispute? 100%. Both, both men. 100%. So even if you've articulated it before, to whatever extent, can you do it now? What, what is the culture that is, what is not it, right about people the culture who are, in your view? Uh, again, the people who have been here on a regular basis have heard this repeatedly. Uh, the kind of culture we want to create is one that not only has accountability, but has people all pulling the same direction. People that are willing to uh, understand we have players from different backgrounds, we have players with different needs, we have players with different strengths and some weaknesses, and that we're all trying to pull the same direction to getting the best out of them all in terms of winning ball games. Uh, anyone who tries to thwart that effort or makes it more about me than the team, meaning the individual as opposed to the team, doesn't fit to what we're trying to do. And those are the type of players that we prioritize in the draft. That's what we preach during in player development, and it's what is going to be a focus going forward and continue to be a focus in player acquisition going forward. So where are the White Sox on that? 
we're work in progress. We're work in progress. We had a problem. We've addressed a good portion of it. and We've got to continue to do it. Rick, you, put the, you put this uh, roster together. I know there's mm -hmm. consensus for it. Where have you gone wrong then in trying to kind of create a cohesive roster and clubhouse? Again, I think a partial part of the element in this is the adversity. I mean, when we, think, when we were rolling in 21, we had some issues. We had some clubhouse issues. We had some disputes along the way in 21. But things were going so well, we were able to overcome. Uh, when we, my mistake, if I want to put one or put a many on me, if you'd like, is that I perhaps overestimated the strength in that room to deal with adversity. Again, we got off to a wretched start and things snowballed from there. I thought uh, we had the strength and the presence to pull ourselves out from under it and keep, you know, instead of throwing stones, like, pull together and bond over the adversity, us against the world kind of thing, and it didn't happen. What was your reaction upon first seeing the comments and just kind of the way it depicted I was shocked. the front office? I was it. shocked. I, again, coming from Key, I was shocked because, again, literally eight days ago, I'm sitting behind this wall, and he's telling me he wants to be back, and he's apologizing for his own unprofessional conduct. Uh, which again, I thought was frankly relatively minor, but Pedro grabbed him up on it, and Pedro, you know, I think gave it to him pretty good about what he did. It was unacceptable. Uh, so I was very surprised from hearing from a guy who really had no issue with while he was here and wanted to return, and he himself was held accountable for certain rule violations, let's say, and, and for him to be pointing the finger that that wasn't happening here, I it was frankly confused by it. We know you that uh, Pedro. Why a lot of people? Go. So, go ahead, you get why a lot of people don't believe you should be the one to fix this. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. And what would you say to that? I mean, it's. Uh, I would say to that, I absolutely get that. It's the nature of pro sports. The fact of the matter is, uh, I probably wasn't as smart as everyone thought I was when I was winning Executive of the Year a couple of years ago, or when. Publication was naming me whatever the hell you name me, Chicago Sports Person of the Year. Uh, and the odds are I'm probably not as stupid as people think I am now. Uh, but this is the nature of the beast, the nature of pro sports. Uh, and look, it, it, at the end of the day, uh, whether I'm here or not, it's going to come down to any of Jerry Reinsdorf or Kenny Williams or myself feeling I'm not the right guy going forward. You wouldn't step down. Again, we're trying to beat the Yankees tonight. Let's see what happens in the next few years. And they beat the Yankees. Let's go. Keep Rick forever. Ugh. Lifetime contract. I want to see next to Nelly Fox, next to Louis Aparicio, next to uh, Ted Lyons and Billy uh, Pierce. Pierce and uh, Paul Gunner, Ring, Paul Gunner, and Scott Pitsenek and Tadahito Gucci. <laughs> I want KW and RH up there. All right. I mean, what? I mean, did you enjoy your time at the parade, folks? Uh, it was such a great time. I well, thoroughly enjoyed it. I remember him sitting up there smugly, just mm, basking in the glow of all the championships he's won. And they and they had to bring up the oh I won them when I was the executive of the year I probably was not that smart I'm oh. not as dumb as I am now <laughs> and smug jerk what did you, what, I mean Do you think that this win on August seventh to make them 22 games under 500 save Rick Hahn's job? I don't know. Nothing's gonna save Rick Hahn's job because his job is doesn't need saving. Um, according to Jerry Reinsdorf, Rick Hahn is my guy. See, there it is. Thank you, Stephen. We can <laughs> you said convict that. him. I know. We yeah. we could we could screw the ad hominem. This man is red caught, red handed, and convicted. For the people who didn't get that, I said that the other day when Rick Hahn made all the good trades, and Stephen clipped it like immediately, and so now forever I'll have that as my uh, little drop in, and then Stephen will do my voice. So at the, after a second, like you'll be a, on the show, Stephen will do the hello for me. And then just keep on playing that Rick Hahn is my guy thing. Play one more. Play one, yeah, play one more. more. All right. Yeah. Rick Hahn is my guy. All right. I just heard the ding of uh, uh, Vinny uh, Duber. So uh, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, you did say, uh, you know, uh, our guy Jerry Reinsdorf declined to comment today on anything. Dude, so, just uh, said no. No. Nothing, no. nothing of interest there. Um, but later on after Rick Hahn uh, spoke, not later on, um, after the Keenan Middleton thing happened, uh around 2:45 uh Shane Reardon 
of 670 The Score went on uh, Parkinson Spiegel uh, and had a report about a physical altercation within the White Sox clubhouse. Uh, he said Grandall wasn't in the lineup the day before the All-Star break, wanted to leave early, made it clear. He's paraphrasing. T.A. said, quote, fuck him. Uh, if he doesn't want to be here, I'll play for his flight. And, quote, Grandall walked over to T.A. in the tub and slapped him across the face. Then uh, that's why Yasmani, uh, or Yasmani does address uh, this report uh, within this this clip. So I just wanted to give Shane's side and then Yasmani here will uh, address his side. And then we'll get to Vinny, uh, who is waiting in the waiting room. And I'm sorry to keep him there, but uh, he waits, he waits, he waits. Um, there you go. Oh, you can play the Yasmani thing now. <laughs> Yeah, my bad. I'm sorry. Yep. <laughs> what do you think about when your stories coming out from a former teammate about this club? Well, I, I, I can only speak for myself, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure they had the chance to, to speak up, and they did. Uh, you know, I had a chance to make, make things right here. Uh, so the fact that they didn't do it for me says a lot. So. Yeah, there's there's nothing nothing much I can say about that. I, I don't know wh wh where it was coming from, what they were thinking. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I was thought whatever happens in a locker room stays in a locker room type of thing. So yeah, that's only me, I guess. Yes, yeah, there's a report out there today that you had a physical altercation with Tim Anderson this season. That specifically oh, yeah. that you slapped him, did you? Oh yeah, this is this is all real. Um, Especially the fact that they said it was a, a day before the All-Star break. i uh, tell you one thing, the one thing I was thinking about that day, especially after that game, was let's go to this lake house I have rented with my family because I haven't spent enough time with them. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I know people are need to do their jobs and they're trying to put a story out, but... Um, uh, it's crazy to to what extent people can can go to, to just put something out there. I mean, I feel like, like you're almost fishing for for, for something. Does, does that mean it happened or didn't happen, or is just, you're just not saying? It? Definitely not. But I think I just I just answered that. There was a mention in there about a lack of rules and accountability within the clubhouse. Do you see accountability in the clubhouse if things you know go off the rails occasionally? Accountability? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, Accountability is for me number one. You got to be accountable for everything. Um, maybe whoever said that wasn't really accountable for their actions. Uh, but when it comes out of me, I mean, I know exactly what people expect out of me. I know exactly what it is that I need to do. Uh, I'm trying to show guys exactly what it is to, or what it means to be accountable for things. Uh, some guys take longer to buy in, some guys don't ever buy in. But I think uh, the group of guys that we have, they have a really good understanding of that. How have you seen uh, Tim evolve uh, with you know, professional, personal problems over the years? And everybody has them in every walk of life. We all know that. Um, how, would, how would you view him and dealing with his adversity right now? Listen, I, I, I think of Tim the same way that I thought of him the first time I got here. I feel like you can be the best shortstop in this game. I think we've all seen it. Uh, I don't think we judge anybody. I think uh, the clubhouse is a safe space. Uh, and like I said, I think I'm very highly. And, and I think there's a lot of team left. Uh, we all make, make mistakes. I'm sure you've made, made, made mistakes before, so uh, I think it's just live and learn. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're going to support Tim no matter what. So there's Yasmani Grandal addressing the clubhouse issues and the reports of a fight. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to welcome in Vinny Duber, and we're going to discuss uh, Yasmani Grandal's comments. We're going to discuss Rick Hahn's comments, uh, and then we'll obviously uh, discuss a little bit about the game today because the White Sox won. Hey, 5-1. to one. Uh, If you are looking to catch a game, catch a game over at Hooters. Our friends over at Hooters is your spot to catch all the games this season. Step up to our plate for world-famous wings, delicious seafood, stack sandwiches, salads, and more. They have tons of great beer selections and $6 drinks all day, every day. 
You can check out their seafood specials too for nineteen eighty three for a pound of crab legs and great prices on buffalo and steamed shrimp. Hooters is celebrating 40 years in business all year long in honor of the anniversary. On the 4th of every month, Hooters will be hosting throwback events, bringing back the 80s with 83 scent wings and other great specials. The next one is on September 4th. You just missed the one for August, Herb, uh, but you can go to OriginalHooters.com for more info. They got 11 Chicagoland locations wet, ready and uh, waiting to welcome you. Um, I feel like, uh, who's the bunny? Silly Wabbit. Uh, saying all that. Oh, well, I'm Elmer, waiting for you. Elmer Fudd. Yeah, I, I feel like that. All right. Um, also, I want to let you know about our friends over at Game Time. If you're looking to find uh, a good deal to a White Sox game this season, right now is your time to buy. Our friend uh, Sarah, the uh, Cubs uh, podcast person, the Cubs podcast, uh, said she could have got tickets for $4 today. Uh, buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets from all these sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the ticket to start getting hyped for all the fun you'll have. They have flash deals and last-minute tickets. And they have easy to find and it's easy to buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. And they'll also have images uh, of the seat views so you'll know what you are buying before you buy. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has the deals on tickets right up to the day of the event as well. $4 today for Yankees White Sox. It's a pretty good deal. deal. Y- Yacht Rock Day tomorrow on the 8th. You get a hat too. If you're the first 10,000. So snag the tickets without the stress. You're going to be stressing about being the first 10,000. So hey. Take all that out of the uh, the equation. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CHGO for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code CHGO for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Let's go out to Guaranteed Rate Field. Uh, I guess we kind of already did a little bit with the video uh, from Ray Khan and Yasmani Grandal, but let's do it officially with our guy Vinny Duber, our CHGO White Sox beat writer. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. He shot those videos of Grandal and Ray Khan, so we appreciate his work. Uh, all day at Guaranteed Rate Field. Hi, Vinny. Guys, how are you tonight? Good. Uh, obviously, we've been talking about the whole stuff that happened before seven ten today. Uh, really, we haven't been talking much about the game, uh, so why not? Let's continue the discussion here. Um, what do you find most interesting from Rick Hahn and Yasmani Grandal today? Or if, if or Pedro Grafal? I mean, what was the most interesting thing from the pregame uh, activities? Yeah, so much going on. Kind of hard to distill this down. I mean, I think it's it's easy uh, to forget that in five days, the White Sox have had Liam Hendricks knocked out for the year with Tommy John surgery. Uh, they've had Tim Anderson get punched in the face in that fight on Saturday night. Uh, and now, late last night, early this morning, with, with all the Middleton stuff, and then all the stuff that jumped off of the Middleton stuff today, any number of, or any one of those things would have been a ridiculous multi-day story for this team uh they've all come within the last five days uh if you didn't think that this season could look any worse or look any more disastrous here it is i don't know if it actually is any more disastrous than it already was because hey they came in tonight 23 games under 500 that's about as big of a disaster as you can possibly imagine but um it just certainly seems like things keep getting worse in the uh the, the visual department um At the end of the day, this specific thing today is probably not going to linger because I think what Rick Hahn said uh, about this being a talking point for a while is very true. I mean, man, we've been talking about culture for months now, it seems like. Um, Rick and Pedro both have talked about it in their media sessions. They have acknowledged that things have not turned out the way they thought they were going to from a cultural standpoint, that there's a lot of work that they need to do from a culture standpoint. I'm not sure that Keenan Middleton saying, uh, oh boy, there's problems in there today, uh, necessarily uh, did anything to change that. That being said, it's a big glaring spotlight that's put back onto it to show you and remind you and tell everybody across baseball, boy, look at how bad things have gone for the White Sox this year. Boy, look at how far away they are from where we thought they were going to be. Um, they, They are working on this. They are making changes. Obviously, that's nothing anybody wants to hear, that it is a work in progress, that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's again, shocking to think that that has been the case. Uh, I've and, and, and so I think, though, that you've got to look up and realize that it's just the reality that this is being talked about that is the most important takeaway, right? It's not necessarily any part of the he said, he said kind of stuff. Um, we can dive into as much of that in, in detail as you'd like, but you're asking me for my biggest takeaway from the day. 
it's that we're talking about this. And it's that this White Sox team that went into spring training with championship level aspirations is continuing to fall further and further away from what those aspirations were. And not only what those aspirations were, but what even the position that they were in to, to hope that they could be in that position. I mean, we talk about it all the time last year, 500 finish. It was the sky has fallen. Look at how much more of the sky there was to fall. Yeah. And that's the thing too. Like Rick Hahn and uh, messages last week where he was trading players away was saying, you know, he wants to compete in 2024, but today him and Pedro both conceded and probably last week too, that, you know, culture has a long way to go and it's a work in progress. To me, those things don't jive. They're not, you know, if you have a bad culture, how are you going to compete next year with the same players for the most part? So I, what they're saying doesn't really work for me that, hey, we're going to compete, but we got some problems with culture still. Well, I think the answer might lie, and, and this was said very little by Rick Hahn today, but it was said, and it was said by, by Pedro and some of the other folks who spoke as well, Perhaps you said they're going to compete. They're going to try to compete with the same players for the most part. For the most part, though, right? Because a lot of because there are seven guys who were on this team a week and a half ago that aren't on this team anymore. And Rick Hahn said some of the work that was done to address the culture was done at the trade deadline. That it was a priority at the trade deadline. Now, obviously, that has something to do with the guys they brought in, right? They're going. They're 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 certainly going forward with players that they think is going to fit their culture. But the team that Rick Hahn put on the field this year to start the year, he was, he said that he overestimated the strength that they would have to survive something, to get through something like they had in April in terms of the results on the field. So you look at how horrible that that, that win-loss record was at the end of April. He's saying he overestimated the strength. That's a fault of his, absolutely. But has the fix been made? We don't, you know, we don't know if you know, they go into next year with, again, what we assume is going to mostly look like the same roster that they have today, but with the seven players that are gone, does that strength suddenly, is it able to be created? Are they able to weather the storm any better? Who knows? And I, and I don't think the idea is that they're going to roll the dice and hope about that. I don't know if that's what he meant specifically. Hey, we had to get rid of all seven of those guys to fix our culture kind of thing. But if the work of the trade deadline was to it done to improve the culture, they sure made a lot of moves at the trade deadline, and that clubhouse looks a lot different than it did a week and a half ago. Yeah, I feel like I'd have to push back on that just a little bit just because I'm trying to work out something. Like, I understand that Grandal denied the report about him and T.A. having a physical alterta- altercation, but as you kind of pointed out, he, he really – he didn't really. Like, he – He did. He, just, he, he eventually got there. He, he eventually yeah. got there, but he didn't do it with little – for me, it wasn't convincing. It wasn't, yeah, that never happened. Whoever said that's an idiot. He, him and the hawed and told the story about his family and going to a lake house, then eventually he got to it. It's like, well, if somebody asked me if I slapped Sean, I'm saying, no, I didn't slap Sean. Cause that's my man, 100 grand. Well, and you'd be lying because you did slap me earlier. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Hey, it's fine. <laughs> I asked you to. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, and guys, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not going to, I'm not playing this game tonight of, was he telling the truth? I'm going to take these guys at their word I, by what they said. Yeah, I understand. I know. I understand yeah. you are. I'm, I'm saying that I, I, I don't know if I can believe it just because, again, like uh, he, he said that, uh, you know, the, the one thing that was on his mind was the lake house. And it's like, OK, well, again, that kind of gives you credence to the story. And then with Rick, like I, I, I we've just been having a little bit of difficulty with Rick because um, I, I, he taught me a, a word about ad hominem. Uh, Courtney taught him it about, um, you know, he's really more you know, kind of attacking the, the, the person um, saying like, hey, well, Keenan told me that he wanted to be here and that, oh, Keenan had this thing two weeks ago that we had to address it. It's like, well, you're not really addressing the actual problems. And then uh, when he was asked, did yes slap TA? He said, yeah, I heard Grandall deny that happening. He told you it didn't happen. Uh, that's accurate. You're not suggesting he's lying to you, I hope. He's just putting you guys in a bad situation. Like, I don't know if you guys are asking if Yasmani's lying or not, but the one thing that Yasmani's going off about is how things shouldn't leave the clubhouse. And that's what Rick started off with, too. We started off that clip with Rick saying, you know, things really don't leave the clubhouse and how that's sacred. So, like, if it did happen, 
How are we actually going to know? Because I don't know if we can really trust those two people who are very, very concerned about not letting things go out of the clubhouse. So I'm not trying to say that Grandal's a liar or Rick Hahn's a liar, and that's not your job. You're not a prosecutor. You're not a jury or a judge. I'm just trying to say, like, this is tough for me to work out because it does seem like it is possible that this happened. And I feel like, again, if, if that is the culture, like, or, you know, if we're talking about culture, like, wouldn't it be good to own up to it? Be like, yeah, me and TA had this spout, but we're adults. We figured it out and we got through it and it's fine because there were many examples of Grandal being a part of that brawl, helping TA calm down and get out of there. So it doesn't seem like there's like any lingering thing. So like, Hey, maybe you say we squashed it, we beefed it, whatever, we move on. Um, I, I'm not trying to put you in a spot where, you know, well, you're you, jumping to the assumption that, what he said didn't happen to actually happen to that he should have answered it differently because he was lying. And we, we, you can't do that. You can, you can go ahead and say, Hey, that answer he gave where he ended up saying that it didn't happen probably could have been worded a bit differently. You could definitely say that, but yeah, I mean, the guy said he, the, we, he was followed up. He was asked for clarification. Are you saying that it didn't happen? And he said, definitely not. So there you go. Yeah. Just we, from my yeah. standpoint, you know, I, choose to believe Shane than over Yasmani, just putting that out there because I have nothing I have no reason to think that Shane would be lying. Shane Reardon a six seventy to score. And, you know, the way that Yasmani answered that question gave me pause, gave me serious pause on how he answered the question. So that's why I was like, nah, I'm good. Again, it's just more of the the, the people themselves. Like, it, it, Yasmani made it clear in the clip that we played. Rick made it clear in the clip that we played. Like, oh, hey, Keenan's really stepping out of line for talking about something that goes on within our clubhouse. And, you know, that really doesn't go outside of our walls. We'll talk about the game. We'll talk about how much we want to win. But, like, you know, the actual stuff that goes in on a day-to-day -day basis, like, the Yankees are probably not happy that all that Domingo Herman like, timeline is out there uh, about how, why he got entered into the uh, alcohol abuse uh, program. Like, there's a timeline of all the stuff that happened uh, to lead to the Yankees having to uh, make that decision on him. Um, like, they probably don't love that that stuff's out there. Same with the White Sox having reports that this stuff's going on in their clubhouse. No team would like that. So I'm just saying, like, those two guys, I think, have a, a reason to – deny it because again they don't want stuff that is within the clubhouse getting out i mean I'm, I'm just saying like i don't know if i can personally trust them but that that's that's just me um do we want to get to the rick stuff i mean did you feel like it was anything new uh with the back and forth with paul sullivan um because it felt kind of what he was saying at the trade deadline about you know hey we're gonna wait and see you know it's it's not really my position and he brought up jerry and, and kenny um that hey it's it's more of their decision than mine on if i'm gonna be here in 2024 yeah, it echoed a lot of the same things he said all year. I think the thing that uh, that is different this time around is that he basically acknowledged that, of course, he understands why people think he shouldn't have this job. You know what I mean? Like he he basically came out and said, yeah, absolutely. I understand why people are questioning that I would get a, another, you know, a chance to fix this. Um, because that's what happens in sports when you when things don't go wrong. People pay for it with their jobs quite quite often. Um, people that have his job pay for it with their jobs quite often, um, and he knows that. Now, again, this is a different, or this is its own situation, right? We know that that uh, you know changes like that are very rare uh, with this with this franchise and uh, in this ballpark. So perhaps that won't happen. But uh, again, for a guy to uh, you know not. He's not painting with, you know, uh, with rainbow, rainbow colored shades, so to speak. He's he's definitely saying, hey, yeah, I get why you're wondering this. And in this industry, that's what can happen. But what's he going to do? Just, you know, sit there and twiddle his thumbs and, and not do anything between now waiting to the end of the season to see if, you know, that decision is ultimately made. I think, you know, the 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 idea that that change is not going to happen in season is something that he mentioned before, too, and something that uh, you, you probably won't see. Why would you see it if it hasn't happened yet? You're not going to see it over the final two months, I'd imagine. So perhaps we are talking about big changes once the regular season is over. But to quote Rick, we'll see what happens. Well, and uh, Herb, to go to one of the things that Rick said about, you know, how do you screw up uh, building the roster? And we included it in the, the chunk we played. Um, he said, I think a part of the element is in this is the adversity. When we were rolling in 2021, uh, we had some issues. We had some clubhouse issues. We had some disputes along the way in 2021, but things were going so well, we were able to overcome them. My mistake, if you want to put one or you could put many on me, if you'd like, uh, is that I perhaps overestimated the strength in that room to deal with adversity. We got off to a wretched start and then things snowballed from there. I thought we had the strength and 
presence to pull ourselves out from under it instead of throwing stones, pull it together and bond over the adversary and that us against the world kind of thing. And it didn't happen. Um, you know, Vinny obviously is talking about the changes in the off season that can happen for a front office. Um, and that usually doesn't happen. Um, but when you look again to the 2023 off season, mm-hmm. like, they they went into the season putting a rookie in right field Correct. Um, when they could have went out and spent more money. They added two players, um, and one of the reports that you know Rick was trying to deny was that it was only pitcher speaking in Toronto. There was one position player that spoke up, and that was Andrew Benatendi. Um, like I, I don't know if he just like it, it seems like there is this realization now, but it, again, like looking at, at the off season, like it didn't seem like there was enough emphasis on adding leadership or at least more veteran presence because there was two guys at it. Like I said at the time, they probably thought that their offseason was knocking it out of the ballpark and they did everything right. They did only the the pieces they needed were been attendee and getting uh, Mike Clevenger in here team solid. But as he said in that quote, you can see he was results driven. Oh man, 2021, I see the problems that are going around here. The culture is not that great. But the W's are, we're winning the division, so I don't need to fix anything. This is why I say process over results. And then also today, the most, I think the most telling thing is when Pedro, and I'm paraphrasing, and Vinny and Sean, you might I, I got, you. got it better. But he pretty much said, I thought there were leaders here, but there weren't. And that struck me as, whoa, he's calling some people out without saying their name specifically. But that is pretty mighty strong because we've discussed – the White Sox having various leaders on their team at the beginning of the year, and maybe those players like Lance Lynn are not there there anymore, but that is damning to me that they don't have necessarily leaders that Pedro thought that the culture would be furthered by them, and they weren't game for it. And so that was a, a, a – I kind of felt it, but for him to say it, kind of refreshing, the honesty, and kind of like shocking too at the same time. Yeah, was it? Was yeah. there? A, do you have the specific quote in mind? I'm not sure. I mean, if it was you, the one you, you, I don't think that that's far off from what he said, Herb. I think that paraphrasing is 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 pretty good. I'm sure there might be some other context in there, but I mean, I remember him saying that, and um, you know, it wasn't so much of uh, necessarily maybe a umbrella level indictment of there's no leaders to be found anywhere on this team kind of thing, but maybe that they he they weren't doing what he needed them to do, or there were certain aspects of what a player leader is supposed to do that were falling to him, which he, which is not good, right? You want that to, to be taken care of by themselves rather than the manager having to go in and micromanage everything. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that this group was, um, I mean, I think what you can see now is that this group on the inside of the clubhouse was as flawed as it was on the on the field, right? I mean, the the the, the things that happened on the field was a team playing bad, players playing poorly, and you can have the you could have kumbaya every day in the clubhouse and if they play that poorly on the field it's not going to it's not going to matter in the eyes of the, of the observers because guess what the record is going to still be what it is it's still going to be a disaster but and and the inverse is true as well nobody was complaining from a fan standpoint or observer standpoint oh my god this team is 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 so poorly poorly run poorly led poor the, the clubhouse is awful when they were winning a division in 2021 right it was it, and and so winning and losing is the thing at the end of the day that colors those opinions and i think when you've got people be they herb what you just said oh that was weird put my finger right in front of the camera um herb <laughs> liked it. Uh, or sean what you guys just said what our <laughs> commenters are saying what i saw all day on twitter which was the instant jump to say you know the extreme of that which is i don't believe a word they're saying or or the just uh these guys how can you even listen to what these guys are saying anymore bah forget them get rid of them all because guess what your opinion has been colored by the fact that they're 22 games under 500 and that they failed to meet expectations so outrageously um but i think what they've done now, we heard Andrew Vaughn say tonight that they think they've finally got a good group in there, that they think the guys that are in there are doing it right. It seems to me that they built this team and there were things missing that they didn't even know were missing. And now they've made some tweaks to the roster and perhaps they think they're on a better track. But guess what? You still got to win games. If, if your team, if they, if they made the, the corrections that they think they needed to make on the culture front and they go into next year with 
just the greatest culture that baseball could possibly have, and they still go out and they play like this every night? Not like this. They won tonight. But they play like this, this 2023 team played. There's still You're still not there yet. There's still changes that got to be made because ev- all of it needs to come together. you got to win. The name of the game is winning. And if that doesn't happen, then we look for reasons why. And obviously there were some big reasons why behind the doors, right? But – They've got they've gotten this they've gotten this far and now they've made these changes. Are they is it is it going to turn them into the best the hottest team in baseball in August and September? I doubt it because you still need to play good. Right. Well, and I mean you can look at the culture of the Yankees and it's like eh, it's probably not great, but also like they're con- uh, you know clearly better with Aaron Judge. So it's like you know maybe maybe they just have uh, better players. Uh, they they'd also win more games. We'll we'll, we'll see. Um, I, I got uh, a little bit of a segue uh, to get into today's game. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about leaders on the other side. Uh, but I do want to give a little update. First homer in the majors since his uh, horrible injury where we were there for the CHGO outing. Mm. Former White Sox great, and I I capital G great. Danny Mendick has hit his first home run uh, since that horrible injury with the Mets. So, uh, hey, shout out to Danny Mendick. Nine Great to Mets see him come back. Beating the Cub. Yeah, t- 10 after, to 2. Uh, for a long uh, rain delay. Uh, yeah, hey, uh, I mean, that was a horrific injury. Uh, Wouldn't be me. <laughs> Adam Hazley, Purple Hazley, uh, running into Danny Mendick on the, the foul pole and or foul, foul, foul line and uh, what broke his leg? Yeah, um, ACL, right? Tore his ACL. Yeah. Tore his ACL, yeah. Brutal. Yeah. Um, and hey, good. Since to see you him brought back. up, since you brought up Adam Purple Hazley, just a couple of rock and roll related notes. Tonight was Grateful Dead night at the ballpark. In my opinion, the the biggest disappointment of the day, the biggest uh, of of the fa- the fallout of today, was that it ruined. It really overshadowed and ruined Grateful Dead night. And I know I'm biased on that front, but that was really upsetting. Also, Dylan Cease. That was a joke. You're allowed to laugh. Also, Dylan Cease uh, <laughs> has a new walk in song, guys. It's Money for Nothing by Dire Straits. Mm. Um, and uh, it's excellent. Uh, if you remember back to when the Giants were good and going to the playoffs and winning the World Series every other mm-hmm. year, there was a time where they were using that as like an eighth, seventh, eighth, ninth inning pump up song for the fans, and it was just like incredible. Dylan Cease had some some of that, some of those vibes tonight coming out of the bullpen when uh, when the intro to Money for Nothing was was playing. So just thought I'd slide that in there. Yeah, just that guitar intro is just. Hemp, get me hyped up right now. Is there? Is there? There's no. Me- there's no message behind it. Just rocking ass some music, right? Yes, I checked with him after the game, and it's. A, he said he heard it when it came on in the car, and it was giving him goosebumps. So he he loved the intro so much that he wanted to time it up with what he was when with when he was walking in from the bullpen, and he lamented <laughs> the fact that I believe. I believe they lamented the fact that there was some talking going on over it. Like so they they started the song hey, and then and then they had to dial it down because like some kid was saying play ball or something like you know there was some thing going on on the field. And so he was ups- a little upset that they dug into it a little bit, but uh it was it, it's so you still have the full the pretty much the full effect. Hey, uh, shout out White Sox time. He wanted his MTV. Yeah, I wonder if if Dylan knows about MTV. I mean the the Entomology of uh, MTV. That song is awesome, to, uh, and the video is even better. You got The a, video uh, is terrible. Oh, you don't like the video? I don't like the video. Oh, no. it's so great. And then also the video that Weird Al did of that video, also great. <laughs> I'm a Weird Al fan too. Yeah, hey, oh, I'm Weird with you there, Herb. Yeah, uh, uh, Weird Al's great. I'm dare to be stupid. Yeah, right. He's, he's you know he's he's got. I mean, he was even into my generations. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, he's good, riding nerdy. Good weird um, biopic. I put those in quotes about Weird Al Yankovic is on. I forgot like Hulu, but it's with uh, the guy from Daniel Radcliffe. Daniel Radcliffe. It is pretty weird, but pretty good. Right, there you go. Yeah, so go ahead if you're a Weird Al fan. Check it out. We still haven't even done the the uh, ad read yet, but I, I feel like you should just sit Dylan down with uh, 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 Sultan's a swing, uh, and just sit sit him down and just tape his reaction and be like, here here is more uh, dire straits. Am I yeah? Is that the right song? One day I'll just yeah, one day I might just I might just airdrop him my entire best of dire straits playlist that I have that he might Wonderful. he could spend the whole day listening to it. Him and Dan McNeil. Hey, buddy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's, let's take a break. Uh, Shady Rays, take on the sun with the gear belts to last. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with the warm weather ahead with premium polarized shades at an affordable price. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that offers a world-class product that's just as good as any expensive pair we've worn. They have durable frames and extremely clear optics for outdoor adventures. That's not all. Shady Rays offers the most impressive 
port, uh, the most insane protection program in all of eyewear. Every pair of sunglasses is backed by lost and broken replacements. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, they told us they will send you a brand new pair. No questions asked. You can wear your Shady Rays in confidence because they have your back long after your purchase. If you don't love your Shady Rays, you can exchange them for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop. Their team always has your back. And exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use code CHGO for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized shades. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 people. And again, get lost on ShadyRays.com with all of their amazing, amazing selections. Got so many colors. And use code CHGO for 50% off your two favorite pairs of polarized shades. Uh, also, so will they get a shade for 50%? And returns for free? I'm sorry, I did not hear you. a single word you just said. I said, so they get their shades for 50% off and their returns for free? Oh, absolutely. Okay. But th- they're, they're, they won't be returned because of the best name sunglasses. Uh, there you go. And uh, hey, uh, Shea Fidel is Corey Hart in the comments. He's wearing his sunglasses at night. Um, we should make, uh, is there a sunny side MTV joke that we can make? Um, sure. So he said cannabis dispensary is your home for judgment free cannabis shopping, a place where all kind of visitors are welcome to explore, discover and purchase a wide array, a wide array of high quality products. Sunnyside has everything you need to elevate your summer. It's a one stop shop for all your cannabis needs, no matter where you are on your cannabis journey. Herb, where are you on your cannabis journey? There. There always, you go. Always. <laughs> <laughs> easy Still online, walking. <laughs> easy online ordering and in-store pickup. Uh, and you'll find Herb there. They mm-hmm. have great transparent loyalty programs. Uh, the Sunnyside Reward Program, so you can get rewarded for buying your marijuana. Uh, Illinois' favorite dispensary. Uh, they have great ones over in Wrigleyville. They got some in Elmwood Park, all the way up to South Beloit Fronts. And they got house of brands, uh, in-house brands of uh, Mindy's, Good News, that's Herb's favorite, uh, Cresco, High Supply, Flora Kale, Wonder, and Remedy. Through August, head to sunnyside.shop and use code CHGO25 at uh, at checkout for 25% off your total order. One use per customer. It's not stackable with other promotions. And that's not only for new customers. Anyone can use our code. So head over to sunnyside.shop and use code CHGO25 for 25% 25 off at checkout uh, of your total order. It's one use per customer. Not stackable with other promotions. Pick up everything you need to elevate your summer. Must be 21 plus or an Illinois med card holder. For MTV, be with some butthead if they're alive Real people actually, they would check out Sunnyside eh, and get their twenty five percent off what are you, while watching Rothstein? their videos. <laughs> eh, 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 eh. Uh, it sucks. Finally, uh, shout out to uh, our friends over at Foco for donating that Tim Anderson bobblehead. Uh, they donated that one, a Southpaw one awesome. as well. Uh, get fitted in the best sports gear around: hoodies, shoes, signs, bobbleheads, and everything you need over at Foco. And since it's baseball season, they got Aloha shirts, straw hats, polos, bags, everything you need for a game. So check out Foco.com, F-O-C-O. Or click the link in the description below for all nine pre-sale items. Use promo code CHO for 10% off. Let's talk about that man, Tim Anderson. All right. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of the game here. Uh, Tim Anderson uh, from MLB uh, did get suspended six games for his uh, side of the Jose Ramirez and Tim Anderson brouhaha. Mm-hmm. Um, what, so he gets suspended for six games. Um, then we see him play today. He leads off. And then in the third inning, he gets hit in the hand or the wrist uh, with a ball. Um, yeah. Left the game. Remillard pinched hit for him. Him forearm. forearm? The arm. Forearm. He got hit in the arm. Yeah. Arm. Okay. Uh, and, fast too, like a ninety-seven mile per hour fastball. It looked fastball. like it hurt. It oh looked like God. it really hurt. He was walking really slow down to first base, just holding that arm. Um, but any reason why he didn't speak? Because obviously Grandal spoke, um, and Tim was obviously involved with the whole thing on Saturday. He got suspended for six games, um, and now with this wrist injury, it's probably a good time to go on the IL or at least take your your suspension. Because hey, uh, it probably takes a while to recover from a Garrett Cole fastball in the arm. Um, but did he speak? Was there any word on why he did or didn't speak? Uh, what was the the the, the word around TA? He did not speak. Um, I think the idea was that he wanted to, or what was told to us by the White Sox is that he wanted to clear his head and just take a couple days before commenting on what happened. Um, we had both Rick Hahn and Pedro Gafol kind of say that they will, the team will make its feelings known or the team will talk about this. I don't know what that meant specifically, but um, once the process is over and the process is not over because guys, because TA is still appealing that suspension. So that's why he played tonight. Um, But yeah, he was given a six game suspension and uh, he's appealing it. Uh, We have not heard from him at all. No one has heard from him at all since, uh, since the fight happened. Uh, He did not speak Saturday night or Sunday in Cleveland and he did not speak pregame today. So um, 
you know, it, like I said, it looked like that that pitch hurt, but that's uh, that's basically all I can give you on the TA front right there because uh, Rick nor uh, Pedro went really went into it very deeply either. Well, I mean, did you read his tweets? <laughs> did I read TA's tweets? Yeah, from last. Did night? he have a long, expansive thing? He yes, his, 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 he was tweeting he did? through. Yeah, he was, and he he eventually erased them. But yeah, he was tweeting no, through. Still up. Oh, they are. Yeah, I thought he tweeted he erased a couple of them. You know, all this happening for a reason. Dot dot dot. We staying focused with this shit. Dot dot. Been going through this shit for a min. Dot dot dot. Keep kicking on me while I'm down. Dot dot. A lot of MF been switching up to dot dot hashtag fake shit. Um, y'all got me fucked up for real for real. Dot dot. Hope you've been. Hope you picking up what I'm putting down to dot dot the bigger picture dot 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 dot. I think pretty much he's saying, y'all, you know, kick me while I'm down, but you know I'm coming back up. Stop talking smack about me. Yeah, I took it on the chin the other day. Whatever, and that's why I said he should be leaning into it instead of being defensive. And but that might be Tim's style. We've seen Tim do that before with the cryptic tweets or the cryptic uh, IG posts, and then go out and perform like the champion that he used to be, and still in the, in his body, I believe. But I couldn't imagine being what Tim has gone through this year with all the stuff, and I don't need to get into it. And then this national embarrassment that happened the other day where uh, Jose Ramirez got a, a punch on him and looked like Tim was out for a little bit, just briefly, but out a little bit. So all the people getting their jokes off, all the stuff that's happened on social media, I think Tim needs to take a break for a mental break just to reassess what his life is all about because this has been tough for him. Like, people have been getting their jokes off, and that's probably half of that where Tim's saying, people have been talking a little too tough with me. You know, I got it, and whatever happened yesterday the other on Saturday is whatever, but, hey, this is a culmination of a lot of things coming and a lot of people hating on me at one time. I wish the person would just step away and say, you know what, let me get my mind right. Let me get my focus right so I can be better for my family and the team if I need to go on for further with this White Sox uh, team if they pick up my option for next year. One more thing I wanted to follow up with you, uh, Vinny. Uh, Jesse Rogers was reporting, and I just I know you're, you're in the actual locker room. Uh, did he move his locker uh, at the start of the season to the corner, and do you, did you think anything of that when that move happened, if it did? Uh, I mean, yeah, his locker position in the locker room changed. I don't know if he did that or if the White Sox did that. Um, Yasmani Grandal's locker moved to where Jose Abreu's locker used to be. Tim Anderson's locker moved to, I guess, let's see, last year it was A.J. Pollock, and prior to that it was where Dallas Keuchel's locker was. Um, Veterans get more space. That's really what this comes down to. Um, You know, uh, Lucas Giolito had empty lockers on either side of his because – Lock, have veterans get more space. Now, once they start calling up guys, and every major league team does this, you know, calls up 20 guys in a year or whatever, that it starts to fill up a little bit more. But corner spots belonged to belonged to Tim Anderson, belonged to Liam Hendricks, belonged to Yasmani Grandal, belonged to Elvis Andrews. Very big space for, for Lucas Giolito, big space for Lance Lynn. Um, you know, this is, they, they reward for lack of a better term, veterans uh, with with more locker space and and better, I guess, better locker position. <laughs> well, actually, I think they cursed him. You explained it pretty well right there. If he is in the locker of A.J. Pollock and Dallas Keuchel, he's cursed. There is no way that he could have any success. Uh, Nomar Mazzara also held that locker in 2020. Uh, Adam LaRoche before him. Uh, I mean, just go down the line. I'll try. I mean, I'm just out of steam today. It's been a Ross lot. Glode. Ross Glode. Ross Thank you. Um, <laughs> those are those last two. You met, those last three you mentioned were jokes, by the way. Yeah. And Ross Glode, I don't know if that's true. He I don't, is. Yeah. His was close I, to we don't we didn't know where we don't know where Omar Mazar's locker was because we didn't get to go in there in 2020. So um, it was actually he had just the the whole south wall. It was just all Omar Mazara. Um, okay, uh, so let's go to the game. Uh, one thing that uh, I saw from Scott Greger pop up on my Twitter, uh, he said it was interesting post game comments from Andrew Vaughn. Uh, quote: I think finally we've got a good group, a group of guys to come together. We're all learning this too. We're younger guys trying to right the ship. I'm not sure if that's veiled at a, a certain person, whether it be Keenan Middleton or Lance Lynn speaking on uh, what's going on in the locker room and him saying they're just young guys. I'm also not sure if this is just Andrew Vaughn with some like coach speak here. I mean, did you did you really get a, a certain tone from it? Uh, I mean, I 
when you read it in print, it probably looks a little more interesting than it was when I was listening to him say it. Um, I think what this comes down to is, again, the message that I said was kind of being sent by Rick and Pedro earlier when they were talking about they've made some changes. They have put some, into effect some what they hope will be fixes, and some of that had to do with personnel, perhaps. I think maybe also what you're getting at is kind of a build-up moment of, all right, hey, we're going to sit down and talk about what kind of team we want to be. And so on the heels of that, there was a meeting in Cleveland. I don't know if that I mentioned that earlier. They apparently had a very big and productive meeting, team meeting while they were in Cleveland. Um, it could just be commenting on that, right? That's saying, finally, now we've got a direction. We know what we're doing and we've got the guys in here that are going to do it. Usually when I think of Andrew Vaughn's answers, particularly in, in group sessions, when they're not in a one-on-one -on -one setting, they usually come down to pretty generic baseball talk and baseball isms uh, at this point. So um, I, I don't think that that was meant to take a shot at anybody. Andrew Vaughn is not really that kind of guy. That being said, you could dig through all the comments today and say maybe there were some personnel moves that have been made over the last week and a half or so that, uh, that were made to address or that helped address some of the issues that, they, that the team believed existed inside that clubhouse. Last thing I got for you, Vinny, and this might be like a Bader Meinhof thing where you're aware of it because you first got an uh, alert, alert, uh, sorry, alert. Harrison Bader who? Bader Meinhof. Uh, it's it's more like once you uh, are aware of something, you can't stop seeing it. So my sister one time got this car, and this is the first time I've ever seen this car. Ever since then, I've been noticing <laughs> those cars much more often. And so when people have been bringing up Andrew Vaughn, I've been like, Andrew Vaughn being a leader, and I'm like, hmm, what? Question mark? And then since then, ever since then, I've been like, hey, I see that leadership quality. Saturday was a big time part of that, where he's seeking out Tim after Tim comes back from the clubhouse, and he's seeking, seeking out him, making sure, sure Tim doesn't get back to the Cleveland Guardians, and he picks him up, takes him back to the clubhouse. That type of stuff Today with the great home run, of course, the the covering at first base after a great play down, down first base. Like, is it just me or is it maybe he is stepping up to the plate to be a leader after so many people have gotten traded? Or is it just happenstance and he's the same guy he's been all year long? Well, he certainly doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, he's been asked about it on multiple occasions now, and, and he's basically saying, like, I'm just going to do whatever and we'll see what happens kind of thing. Um, you know, obviously Rick Hahn brought him up as a leadership candidate back uh, at the after some of the trades were made, um, and he mentioned what you just mentioned today. Rick mentioned that, that moment with Andrew and Tim in Cleveland on Saturday night. Um, certainly the, the he had a great game you know the the home run was a big deal the the play at first base was abreu-esque if you remember back to uh jose saving carlos rodon's no hitter with uh, basically that exact same play um and we were all we all holding our breath thinking that he you know blew out his knee trying to do so but um it, it, so I don't know if you can point to the on-field stuff and say, hey, he's a leader because he's making good plays. They've expected him for a long time to be making good plays and, 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 and hitting home runs. Um, but look who's left, right? Look who's left in this clubhouse and look who's left of this core. Um, Vaughn is a guy who they made the number, third, number three pick in the draft, a guy who they skipped, or not skipped, but fast track to the majors because they thought he was ready for it, right? They, they, he did not play much uh, minor league baseball before coming to the major leagues. He's a guy that they talked up as not only someone who could step into a an everyday DH job without any major league experience, but then a guy that could go ahead and play the outfield without any uh, professional experience doing that. They've talked him up as that kind of player for a very long time now. And to hear that they have had in mind him being a leader, him continuing that lineage, right? That uh, that Frank, Pauly, Jose Abreu lineage at first base. Maybe they thought they stumbled upon, you know, Paul Canerco 2.0 here, and they, they are trying to uh, uh, picture him as that kind of player, not just on the back of the baseball card, but in what he means to this franchise as a whole. So again, uh, that sounds to me like a lot of pressure to put on somebody who has not had a lot of, you know, an overwhelming amount of success at the major league level quite yet. But 
he's here. He's not going anywhere. And as that core moves forward, I think he's going to be as big a part of it as anybody. So it would not surprise me that they envision him as that kind of player. But I think his answers are, are pretty correct, too, in when he says, I'm not trying to, to grab that role. I'm going to let my, my play kind of speak for itself and, and, and do everything I can. And if that's what happens, that's what happens kind of thing. Yeah, this podcast has been going on uh, for a while, and I feel like if I ask you this question, you might hate me, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, so <laughs> on July 30th, Pedro Grafal said on Andrew Benatendi uh, batting fifth uh, that he wants to do it more regularly uh, regardless of the handedness of picture um, and that he's, quote, really good with runners in scoring position, doesn't hit many ground balls, doesn't strike out much, got an act for driving guys in. I want to put him in a position where he can drive some runs in see what it looks like. They did that for three games and now he's uh, back and switched around the lineups. It feels like literally like what, what's the game chairs, uh, musical, musical chairs. Musical chairs with Andrew Benatendi in the lineup. I mean, he was third in spring training. Then he was second. Then he was fifth. Then he was seventh. And then he's uh, you know second against uh, le- right, 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 hand, right handers, but he's seventh against lefties. What the hell's going on? Great question. Because okay. I looked up today and I noticed the same thing. I go, Oh, Benatendi's batting second. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wasn't he supposed to not be doing that for a while? Um, again, not something that was a, a priority for us to ask Pedro about on, on, on a very bizarre day here at the, at the ballpark. Uh, but uh, I guess I will say this just to add something to, to kind of answer your question there. Um, Pedro has talked numerous times since the very start of spring training all the way to just a few, you know, a few days ago or the last time they were home here, um, about the versatility that Benintendi has in the lineup. He feels comfortable batting him basically anywhere. And so if that's the way it's going to go, that's the way it's go. It's going to go. I don't think that Pedro is upset about batting Benintendi in any position. I think it reveals probably more about the other players than it, may, than it might about Benintendi because he believes Benintendi can have success in whatever role he's in. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's more about Moncada and what they've seen from Moncada. I mean, he made, he made the uh, remark on the 30th. Moncada was batting second, 29th, 30th, first, and second, and then he was slid down around four and five. I'm not sure, though. We'll we'll have to wait and see. Um, maybe you could ask Pedro tomorrow, and hey, if you see Rick, maybe ask him about trying, signing Shohei Otani. Maybe we'll change it up on him and just <laughs> throw him a complete curveball. Um, final thing, Luis Robert hit his 30th double today. Um, most 30-30 uh, seasons in White Sox history. Luis Robert's got one. He's the 27th player in uh, White Sox history with a 30-30 season, 30 doubles, and 30 home runs. Frank's got six. Jose has five. Paul Canerco's got uh, four. Maglio's got four. Carlos Reyes got two. Albert Bell's got two. Luis obviously has the most recent one uh, this year. Jermaine Dye in 2008. Creedy in 2006. Robin Ventura in 1996. Uh, and obviously Abreu before uh, Robert was the uh, last to do it in 2021. Um, still a couple more milestones left. I think he's going to hit 40-40. Um, so, I mean, 10 more homers, 10 more doubles. Uh, oh. I mean... 30, 30, and, and 30? Uh, I don't know. I mean, what, uh, where, where do we think he's going to end with uh, doubles, homers, and, and steals here uh, with, you know, a certain amount of games left? I don't think he's going to play all the rest of these games, especially because they're out of the the playoff hunt. So I don't think in the majority of these two months he'll play, and so he'll probably hit 10 more home runs and probably come short on the doubles. So 10 home runs and maybe five doubles, and I don't know how many steals he needs to get to the 30 mark. Well, 16. He's at 14 steals. It's going to be tough. So, So, yes. 40, 40, and 20? Yeah, it's going to be real tough. Um, But, yeah, 40, 40 is going to be real hard. And I like Delbert Bell. Two years here, two ass-kickingly great offensive years. He left and got paid. Deuces. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Where do you think he's going to land, Vinny? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think he could get to 40, 40 in terms of – home runs and doubles. Why not? There's about two, about two months left. Um, I don't know exactly how the pace projects out at the, at this very moment, but he could get there. We've seen him get really, really hot before. And you know, all you got to do is have a few of those moments where you're getting them in bunches and it, it, it jacks it up pretty quick. So um, he could get there. Don't know if he will get there, but man, if he hits 40 home runs, that's, that's pretty damn good. Yeah, it would be fantastic. I mean, that'd be so exciting to see 40 homers. You think homers. he's going to get there? Um, I, I think he hits 40 homers. Okay. I, I think he's going to get really uh, grooving, and I think I think he gets to 40 homers. Um, he had 11 homers in June. He had nine doubles in May and July. Um, so, I mean, he's got the ability to rack them up in, in a month. So, we'll see. Um, maybe he just goes completely nuclear against the AL Central in September. It just kind of makes it laughable. Uh, they go on a bit of a run. That'd be funny. 
Um, maybe they're 10 games under 500 just because of Luis Robert Jr. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, we, we, get, we get to under uh, double digits uh, behind the Minnesota Twins. <laughs> We're just like, huh, maybe he's, he's going to have a 10 <laughs> war season and half of it's just in the, the latter half of September. Uh, anyways, thank you everyone for joining us. Make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button. Uh, thank you to Vinny Duber for reporting from guaranteed rate field. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. That's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him on Twitter at Eckner wall 23 is our CHGO White Sox community leader. And I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Thank you to everyone for hanging out with us uh, tonight. We'll be back with you tomorrow. We got a pregame and a post game. So 6.30 pregame and a post game after the fact. We'll talk to you then. Bye.